A griot was a person in Africa who was charged with keeping the stories of the village. Use your voice to do something. Going through hard times don't make you weak. I'm praying for y'all city. If you're protesting, keep doing what you gotta do to be heard. Seen a video on Facebook that kind of uh, disturbed me. It's because I'm afraid of failing. And we still asking for the simple right to breathe. When somebody only cares about money and they don't care about your life, why do you give them the time of day? You know what I'm saying? I had nothing but love in my heart for everybody. Integrity. Even if nobody's looking, you do the right thing. I would like to sit down and have a more intimate conversation with you guys. Death is literally the end of life. Time passes us by. Like, we... We have an expiration date. Live by the sword, die by the sword. I wish that the culture of being smart, intelligent would continue being pushed to our kids. I'm Griot. When a Griot dies, it's like a library is burnt down. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy Griot. Welcome back. This is another episode where we will be getting into the Elaine Race Massacre once again. I didn't touch too heavy into it last time. Um, after doing more more research, more reading, I decided that this topic deserved more light. So, like I said last time, if you have not read Damaged Heritage, you need to go pick this up. It is an amazing book. Um, two ancestors on opposite sides of the coin. They learn their family history. Uh, they go back, they revisit it to heal and grow and get specifics together. So, for those that don't know what the Elaine uh, Race Massacre was, uh, September 30th through October 1st, 1919, at Hoop Spur in the vicinity of Elaine in rural Phillips County, Arkansas, there was a massacre that occurred between black and white sharecroppers. The governor at the time named named Charles Hillman Brow, Brow, who requested troops and KKK members from surrounding states and surrounding areas to come to help. So what essentially happened was the black sharecroppers at the time were not getting paid the amount of money due to the work that they were putting in. Mind you, this is the same time period where World War One was uh, occurring. So, you had troops, black troops, coming back home to their families, um, poor families. And you had a couple of black families who were, who had advanced and actually had a little bit of uh, generational wealth, right? Some of those individuals became lawyers. Um, some of them were sending their kids to school at the time. But majority of this area, black sharecroppers, still out working in the fields. They decided to hold a meeting with about 100 people inside of a church. And when they did this, this meeting was specifically to figure out how to push an agenda to bring the quality of life to a higher standard and because they had this idea that they wanted to do better for themselves the white sharecroppers and the KKK members at the time they got a hold of this information through um, a couple of informants who happened to be black uh, they showed them where this meeting was happening they decided to shoot into the church um, the black members in the church shot back. They killed two people, or oh, two white people at the time. And like I said, those individuals and other KKK members on the first day tracked down about 20 black people and ended up killing them. When the troops came in, and this is what I found out recently by reading this book. So... They called in KKK members, but they also called in federal troops, military members. And white military members, they came to calm the riot, or so to speak, 
But what they ended up doing was the first thing they did was they burnt. They they found one black person, and they used them as a sac sacrificial lamb. They ended up burning them in the middle of the street. Then, into that weekend, they commenced hanging, shooting, and slaughtering black people in a large amount at one time. So the, the death ratio, some people say 850. Scholars argue that it was somewhere around 300 to 500. Others say it was, it was in the hundreds. They, they're not exactly certain how many black people died. Taking a pause right there. They killed so many black people, they don't know how many black people they killed. Where the bodies go? Like, they didn't have any remorse or empathy to those individuals. They either left them where they were, they just threw them somewhere. They didn't, they didn't care about those individuals at all. And they just mowed them down with machine guns. They, they just slaughtered them. You have families that are still alive and don't even know where their relatives wound up or ended up. The level of evil that's I can't even I can't even bring words to it. That's that's insane. Especially knowing that the government has something to do with this, right? So black female Sheila L. Walker. Her great uncle, Albert Giles, was a member of the Lane 12. The, the Lane 12, after this onslaught stopped, the mob got angry and they wanted revenge. So they wanted to keep killing. But the governor, to save face, pretty much has... And their biggest concern was, at the time of the season, at that moment, they had to continue sharecropping. They didn't want a mass exodus of black people to leave. So to calm everybody down and try and get back to the normal status quo, they decided that they were going to give the mob what they deserve. How this all came about, by the way, in the initial proceedings, they made up a story. So they said that the four white gentlemen that stopped by the church had a blown out tire. They stopped to get out the fix the t fix the tire and replace it, and they were ambushed. In result, they fired back, and that's what started everything. Them creating that lie, they pushed it out to the surrounding areas. They got people upset, hyped up. Um, they created fear and anger, and then they took that and they used that as a tool to slaughter random groups of black people. You think about today's society, how the last administration used fear and they ramped up to all these lies and they got people to cause an insurrection and march on the Capitol. That's how deep a lie goes. That's the level of hatred and fear it can bring out of people. A lie. So, going back into the jury, the Lane 12, um, Albert Giles was one of them. They imprisoned them into a prison called the Walls. That was like Supermax, right? Um, it was a prison outside of Little Rock, Arkansas. That's where they held the Elaine 12. However, in the Elaine High School, they held hundreds of black people, like a, like a concentration camp, the remaining families that were there. Everybody was charged. The trials lasted 20 minutes, most. They didn't have proper representation, and their jury was all white. So, 
they were immediately locked up. The lane 12 was sent to the, the uh, to a prison called the Walls, where they were to await their dates of execution. And this is all to give satisfaction to a white mob who simply just wanted to murder them all anyway. So they, they never got a fair trial. Well, a man named Scipio Africanus Jones, who was from the area, who had left and went to school, he heard about what happened. He ended up becoming an attorney. So he came back. He um he ended up writing to the Supreme Court saying, "Hey, the, you know these people didn't have a fair trial. They went through the trial pro a process. This took years, by the way. And during the trial process, they kept having to push it back, push back the uh, the execution dates. While this was going on, the only person that he actually had in his corner." was a Confederate soldier, Colonel George W. Murphy Jones, who actually ended up becoming sick and died during the trials, right? So Jones is doing everything he can. He's fighting, he's fighting, he's fighting. Every time he fights, they keep coming up with loopholes. And then he finally got some light on it, right? So if you go look at... The 14th Amendment, Section 1. All persons born or natural or natural natural naturali naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States. In other states wherein they reside, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privilege or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process or law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. When they initially charged all of these people, they did it without any legal or any real legal standings they completely threw the constitution and the our amendments out the window so since this is the 14th amendment the supreme court said you know what because you guys did this we're going to make you let a couple of them go and we're going to and because of that you have to have a retrial so they had a retrial with proper representation afterwards which caused Moore vs. Dempsey, United States Supreme Court's case, court case in which the court ruled 6-2 that the defendant's mob-dominated trials deprived them of due process guaranteed by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. It reversed the district court decision declining the petitioner's right of habeas corpus. The case was a precedent for the Supreme Court's review of state criminal trials in terms of the compliance with the Bill of Rights. This caused all of those black Americans at the time to be freed. It didn't happen overnight. It actually wound up being over years. By 1923, they were all found innocent and eventually freed. But because of Moore versus Dempsey, after 1919, here in Florida, Rosewood, Florida, again, we had a situation where white mobs were angry at this decision. So in Rosewood, they hunted down a bunch of black people, hung them, and burned them. They actually went into the woods, hunted black people, killed them, burned them, and they hung them. So looking at these dates, 1923. 1919 that is not that is not long ago there are still people alive walking around in Florida that can tell you about these these incidents and this time period they'll tell you like it was yesterday yes I remember that 
so knowing this and then thinking about present day, right? If you if you put them side by side parallel to each other and then you think about it, the mistakes that we made or the mistakes America made, let me have to correct myself, back then they are st we are still making today. And then when you think about the judicial system, these same issues that they encountered then, we encounter now. So over this span of time, even though I, I, I clearly just said it's not that long ago, but one would think it's long enough to have real change. So why is it that we hire these lawmakers and we put them in these positions and they're clearly not doing their job? Everyone I talked to that went to vote for the majority, I would say 95% didn't know who they were voting for and why. They, the only thing they focused on was the presidential election, which, thank you, because we needed a change in that. But what about everyone else? What about your senators? What about your mayors? There are, there are people in your state that you have to make sure that their policies align with how you feel and how you think, which means you don't just do research on the president. You do research for all of those. You do research for your district, the laws that they're bringing up. You look to see which laws they want to change, and you ask the question, why these laws and not those laws? And then you write these individuals and you ask them, why is it that you're focused on this and not that? Have a question and attitude. Vice just taken was given to you. Woodrow Wilson, the 28th president. Let's talk about him for a moment, right? So people would lead you to believe that Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson, our 28th president, was a great guy. Name off a couple of good things he did for y'all or for America, right? He is best known for winning the Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to found the, leagues, leagues, the League of Nations. This is during World War I. Also, he fought against monopolies and child labor. So that makes him sound amazing, right? He won the Nobel Peace Prize. Psych. The man was a segregationist. In his resume, Wilson was also a segregationist who wrote a, who wrote a history textbook praising the Confederacy and the Ku Klux Klan. As president, he rolled back hard-fought progress for black Americans who personally oversaw the segregation of multiple agencies of the federal government. So he was president. Matter of fact, they voted him in, in 1912. He served for eight years. So in 1919, when this happened in Elaine, he was president. He authorized the use of troops to mow down scores of black people. This is a president. And then after that incident, when they were going through their case, when they were going through the courts, he sat back and said nothing. So now in Rosewood, Florida, the incident happens again. He says nothing. But people will lead you to believe that that man deserves a Nobel Peace Prize. Just because somebody sits in a position does not make them a leader and it does not qualify them to, for shit. And for him to let American citizens die like that, personally, I could care less for him or his legacy. But, you know, I only come on here all the time and try and get y'all to go back and read and look up resources. By the way, if you want to know where I'm getting my my um material go by damage heritage go to www.pbs.com you can go to the ch uh, history channel those are just three of the resources that i use wikipedia if you don't trust it there's plenty of other resources barnes and noble go to barnes and noble that's where i got this book and you can go do all the reading you need to it's at the tip of your fingertips
You cannot have conversations with people. If I talk to somebody and we went back and forth with each other, I can tell if you just went to Facebook or you went to or you're using the meme. I want to know where you got your information from. I want to know why you feel the way you feel and you should use your mind to come up with an educated conclusion or summary of what you're talking about. This is a tragedy in America. One of many. <laughs> Rosewood, Florida, one of many. Tulsa, one of many. We can go back and forth as much as you want to, but this has happened. It continues to happen. Every time a police officer chokes out a black man or woman, guess what? It just adds on and stacks it. For us to change this country, we have to change the judicial system and the law. We have to change the way that these three-letter organizations work. We have to put in that work to make this happen. That means we have to put pressure on our lawmakers, our Senate, our president. They work for us. We don't work for them. They would like you to believe that we work for them, but they work for us. So if you have a voice, use your voice. Write and call. If they don't pick up the first time, call again. They don't pick up the second time, keep on calling. Leave voicemails. Go stand in front of the, um, the Capitol in your state. Demand what you want. That's the only way things that's the only that's the only way you get the things that you want in this life. I don't know what else to say. I'm going to keep on saying this until the day I die. Never going to change. So, I hope you guys do some research. I hope you guys go pick up these books and learn something. Um one thing I do want to point out going back to that Confederate soldier who actually worked with uh Scipio African, Africanus Jones. That shows you that people do change. And I know I get on here and I harp a lot. And I understand that some people could feel, sometimes feel attacked. I'm not attacking everybody. I'm only attacking the people that constantly argue and constantly try and prove a point without seeing the other side of the coin. Stop feeling attacked. You have to have these conversations if you want to move on and heal. Telling black people, get over it, it's never going to happen. Because the more you say that, the more we're going to throw this shit in your face and the more you're going to hear about it. Period. So shout out to the Confederate soldier who changed his ways even though he died shortly <laughs> after helping Africanus. Hey man, people can change. So have these conversations with each other. You know, um... Have a conversation without having to argue. Something I learned after watching an interview, well, not an interview, but a debate with James Baldwin, and I forgot the uh, the white brother's name. They had completely different ideas, right, or ideologies. But because they were able to talk to each other like men, at the end of it, they saw where each other were coming from, and both of them learned something. Until we can get back to that, it's going to be chaos. Hey, man, thank y'all for joining me again. Um, I can't change the world alone, so I need y'all to change it with me. Make sure y'all keep coming back. Make sure y'all keep tuning in. And I'll see y'all next time. Peace. Screw Let's go. Let's go.